with us last week, I told us that we need to get ready. Get ready for what? And uh, just as the Lord had brought the Israelites to the bank of the Jordan River, here we are at the bank of the Jordan River. Right? I'm going to do it. Our toes. <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes. But our toes are sitting here on the bank of the Jordan River. Right? Israelites have been wandering around back here for years, for years, for decades, four decades, 40 years. And here they were, their toes at the brink of the Jordan River. And it was time for them to cross over into what the Lord had promised, where the Lord was, where the Lord is leading, and where they were going to go walk alongside him, but also meet him. And we, we started unpacking Joshua chapter 1. We're going to pick it up, Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. If you have your Bible on you, go ahead and open it up or look up here behind me, where it says, Be strong and courageous. You're going to hear me say that phrase three different times because it's covered in verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9. And it's that phrase, be strong and courageous, which if you're walking through Hobby Lobby or I almost said factory to you. You remember factory to you? (laughs) Wow, I don't know where that came from. But um, Hobby Lobby or Walmart, uh, wherever it is, you can... I have not thought about factory to you in forever. That was a... Whoa! (laughs) But whether you're walking through and you see that sign, right? Be strong and courageous in other words that are underneath. But be strong and courageous. Joshua 1.6, Joshua 1.7, Joshua 1.9, right? Be strong and courageous. But that's not the focus today. Be strong. We do need to be strong and courageous, but technically that means be strong and courageous in him. In other words, he's already done all the work. He's done all the legwork. Trust him. Fix your eyes on him. Don't do this in your own strength. Do this on his strength. Rely on his power. If you have an amplified version, it literally means be confident in him, not in yourself. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit. This entire sermon is on that seven-letter word, inherit, because you will inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Here it is again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Say that back to me. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you. Here's this three-word phrase. Wherever you go. Last week I told you to get ready. Your toes are on the brink of the Jordan River. The Lord will be with you wherever you go. And the title of the sermon today is where are we going? Where are we going? Something that the Israelites, Joshua and the Israelites, he knew. Joshua knew 40 years prior where he was going. We're going to the land God promised, the land flowing with milk and honey. Me and Caleb are ready. What are y'all 10 doing? And for 40 years, Joshua knew where he was going. What he didn't know was how he was going to get there. He knew it would ultimately be in the Lord's strength, but Lord, what are you going to do? He knew where he was going, but how was he going to get there? That's something you and I talked about over two years ago. You remember that day? The restaurant, people in the restaurant were too nice to kick us out. Those poor people. Dude, we abused that outdoor patio. Yeah, we did. We were were great to them. We We tipped them well. We overstayed. They were too nice to kick us out. They closed the restaurant, cleaned it, shut the lights off, and left. And we stayed there for another hour. Left us on the patio. But we kept talking. And we knew, because, dude, you were raised in this, dude. You were raised in this. You, this is all you, since, since, since literally in there. Like, that was little baby Graham back in there, right? <laughs> Okay, little mini graham cracker back there. Okay, (laughs) back there. All right, right. Look just like Tommy, right back there. You were right. This is all. This is all you have ever known. And you were telling me all about it, man. If there's a group you've led, if there's a project you've done it, if there's there's a sermon you've probably heard it, if there's if there's a venture you have you have been a part of it. And I was sharing. I wasn't raised in it. I'm a heathen. I wasn't raised in it. (laughs) Okay. 
But I was fortunate enough to see what happens when local goes citywide or when citywide goes regional or when regional goes national or even when national goes global. I've seen how big these rooms get. I've seen how massive these projects go. I've seen it. And you and I were comparing notes, which is why it took, we were literally just unrolling everything. Like what really goes in to all of this? Not just the pretty package message on Sunday. Like what really goes into this? What it takes. It's the cost, the investment. And what is it? 10% of people do 90% of the work all the time, right? And we just placate and placate and placate. And we're like, something's not right. Because we read book after book and, you know, we sit there and that's great. But then we get back to the book, the Bible, and we keep reading it. And we're just doing a comparison, like with the Venn diagram. Remember the Venn diagram? What do we read in Scripture? What do we see on what we're doing? And we would just do the Venn diagram, right, all the time. And what did we say? It's not adding up. That three-letter phrase, the ROI does not match. The return on investment just doesn't match. Y'all have a Google Drive? Like Gmail? Who has Hotmail? Anybody have Hotmail anymore? <laughs> I tried mine the other day. It shut down. <laughs> but I have, I, have a, I have a Gmail account. I have multiple Gmail accounts, it seems like. But I got a, a notification that told me that my Gmail account was my storage. My drive was running, was getting full, which was code for buy more storage. It's like, I don't need more storage. I got me a hard drive. I'm not buying nothing. But So I started cleaning it up. I started cleaning up my hard drive the other day. I started going back through, seeing things. I saw things from like 2017 in my life. I'm going back through. And I got to 2021 when I was cleaning this up, and I laughed when I came across this. You remember? Y'all remember this? You guys remember? You guys remember this? Y'all remember this? This was from December of 2021. Y'all, Ange and I got here at the end of October 2021. We kind of got adjusted to Arizona, and I started kind of... You know, I got back to, to Arizona from North Carolina. In December of 2021, we walked in the doors, rolled our sleeves up, and kind of said, okay, here we go. Let's get to work. Spent a month kind of going, how are we doing things? Why are we doing that? Do we need to keep doing that? Is the ROI there? Why does that work? Why does that work? Okay, cool. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to throw a massive lunch, and we're going to invite everybody. A massive dinner. We're going to massive dinner. I said, and I remember, forget when I told Ange. I said, hey, Ange, cater. I said, we're going to feed like 100 people. And she's like, how? And I'm like, we are. Remember that? Sh- There's my wife. Remember that? $1,000. Let's go. Let's buy dinner for the whole church. We're going to tell them where we're going. It was going to be kind of a restatement of what we talked about. Right? We're going to condense it down. We spent like eight hours. We're going to condense it down. And ultimately what we landed on, how we grow. We are not going to grow from the outside in. We are going to grow from the inside out. You can't lengthen your, straight, your stake with, until you first strengthen it. If I stretch a piece of fabric and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it, at some point you're going to rip that sucker unless you strengthen it, anchor it. you got to grow inwardly, then grow outwardly, and you grow from the inside out. Otherwise, you're in the center. If you try to go from the outside in, you are just literally running wind sprints to the outside, trying to bring people back in, trying to be, no, 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 you got to flip that. you got to go from the inside out. If you were to keep following, which I didn't give you the, the, the rest of the PowerPoint, but, or PowerPoint, pro presenter, but <laughs> I didn't give the rest of it, but if you were to keep following, it would be Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Y'all, that was two years ago. Over two years ago. Literally a week ago, used the same verbiage. Has not changed. From day one, it has not changed. We've been utilizing the same exact verbiage. We've known where we're going. Before we got here, we knew where we were going. Call it an agenda, if you will. We knew where we were going. We knew it. Didn't always know how to get there, but we knew where we were going. I just didn't know exactly. I knew how we were going to get there, but I didn't know how we were going to get there. What do you mean? I don't know. I knew how we were going to get there, but I didn't know how we were going to get there, but I knew where we were going. Got a lot of input on how to get there. Why are you giggling? <laughs> it's the nicest way I can say it, man. I got a lot of input, got a lot of feedback on, on what, the, what the best way to get. That's the nicest way I can say it, bro. It's the nicest way I can say it. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is I encountered a lot of impedance along the way. A lot of impedance. A lot of obstacles, a lot of things in the way. 
Unfortunate, not unexpected, but un- unfortunate. You have to understand that's just part of it. And that's what the book of Joshua literally is about. The book of Joshua. Okay, you've got Joshua and the Israelites. God promised this. They're going. Here they go. The whole book of Joshua, you know what it notates? The impedance that Joshua and the Israelites would encounter as they went. It's part of it. Impedance, obstacles, it's part of it. Whatever the Lord is doing in your life, wherever he is leading, do not be shocked when people don't like it, get it, understand it. They're in, embrace the misunderstanding. It's just a reality of it. And sometimes it's going to be those people who are closest to you, and they're not doing it to be mean. They're doing it because they love you. They're scared. They're uncertain. And oftentimes they will hold on to you, trying to hold you back because they don't know. They have no idea what the Lord is doing in your life. And that's what the book of Joshua talks about. And so we're sitting here trying to answer this question, where are we going? Where are we going? And you have all, at some point in your life, wondered that, written that down, where are we going? Talking about you, your personal life. You might be sitting here, okay, we're just talking about variables at this point. Same question, variables are different. You might be looking at your job. Where am I going? Should I quit this job? I mean, I like this job. I'm comfortable in this job. I, I, do I really want to be the new guy in the, in, the, in, the, in the company all over again? Or the school. Should I really go to this school? Or is next gen? That next gen here pretty soon, our teenagers, they're going to be starting to have to ask the question, where do I want to go to school? What do I want to go to school for? Should I go to school for this? Should I stay with this? Should I start over? Should I take a break? Should I work? Then go to what, where? Should, what should I do? Some parents are going, should I leave my kids in school? Should I take them home and homeschool them? Or some parents are homeschooling them and going, should I send them back to school? Where are we going? What do I do? I don't know. And then it doesn't change. As you accumulate wealth, you start to go, what do I do with this? Do I invest it? Do I sit on it? If I'm going to invest it, where do I invest it? Talk to Graham. He'll probably know what to do. Or <laughs> I love you, buddy. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Don't do that, he says. You know, or at least, how do I spend my savings? Can I, re- can I retire now? Do I have to work till this day? Well, if I, if I stay, if I, if I retire now, am I going to have enough in retirement? Well, if I wait and I retire later, am I going to be able to enjoy my, what do I do? Where are, where are we going? Right? If you're like me, you wonder it out loud. And oftentimes I'm like, where are we going, Lord? I don't know. And that's what I had to know. I've been sitting here all stinking year. Where are we going? Wait, 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 wait. We got to deal with what? I wish I'd have known this before I left. And God's like, because you wouldn't have come. I'm like, no kidding. You don't say. I wish I'd have known. And that's what I'm trying to figure this out. And we're all trying to figure this out. Is this right? Because ultimately, you got to make a decision. you got to make a decision. You can contemplate and walk around the wilderness for four years, but at some point, you got to make a decision on where the Lord is leading you. Is this right? I need a litmus test. This unexpected thing showed up in my life. I've got two options. Option A, go. Option B, stay. And I don't know what to do. When unexpected shows in your, up in your life, how do we test it? Because Nehemiah had unexpected show up in his life. Nehemiah is going back to rebuild the holy city, Jerusalem, and he's up there and he's up on the wall and he's building the wall. Walls, you needed to have walls to fortify a city. Without walls, you really weren't a city. So he's up there building and three unexpected visitors come. Each visitor represents an opportunity. What does he do? Does he stop building and come down and entertain them or does he do, say what he said? I'm too busy doing this to come down and be bothered with whatever it is that you've come to talk to me about. But how do you know? How do you know when to kick an opportunity away and go, sorry, too busy to be bothered with what it is that you're about to talk to me about versus, hey, let me put this up here, come down. What it, how do you know? The Bible actually gives us a test to figure out exactly how to know. And that's why I went to Dallas. That's why I had to know. I did not go to Dallas to go on vacation. I went to Dallas because I went, Lord, I've been doing everything, every, everything in my power. Everything that I physically can do to be obedient with the place 
and what you've entrusted in me. I'm trying to do the very best that I can. Where are we going? God, is this right? And verse 6 says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to your ancestors to give them. I'm sitting here going, I'm doing everything I can, God. Everything that I can. And then the word inherit. And I'm going, okay, now I have a problem because I'm working. And the Bible's talking about it's inheritance, not... That word inheritance, it's the, it's the Hebrew word nahal. The sea is silent. Nahal. I don't know how to speak Hebrew. Nahal. Right? <laughs> Just throw it in there, right? Just kind of move over and make it sound smart. Uh, <laughs> it's actually used, it's 68 different times. Remember, you got the Old Testament, everything leading up to Jesus. New Testament, Jesus, and everything after Jesus. Old Testament, primarily in Hebrew. New Testament, primarily in Greek. Little parts of Aramaic split, are sprinkled all throughout. The Hebrew word, nahal, it's used 68 times in the Old Testament. And more times than not, the vast majority of the time, the word is translated inherit. Inherit. And the word inherit, I wrote it down so I didn't mess it up. It means, literally, it's not mind-boggling. The word inherit means to receive. Receive. When the Lord is leading you somewhere, it will be something that you receive. And here I am. What do you want me to do? Nothing. Stop trying to achieve everything. Receive. I want to receive. I want to achieve because I like to achieve. Achieving's fun. <laughs> but here I'm sitting on this word, this one little word. Y'all studied the snot out of this little word. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of lessons. I, I, I wrote down five. I had five different as I'm exegeting this text, I'm going, there's five different ideas that I think I could explain this text through. But if I did, that's why I have to be disciplined. <laughs> because if I did that, we'll be here all day and everybody's like, kickoff's pretty soon, bro, so get to the point. Um, instead of picking them all, I, I, I think we had to look through the most important one. And the most important lens that I could explain this through is God's promise. God's promise of where he was leading them. God's promise of where he's leading us. Simply stated, what it means is when, God prom when God's leading you somewhere, and he promises it, it means he's already been where he's leading you. God's not sitting back here going, what's on the other side? I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> Want to go? Want to go on an adventure? God's already been here. Here's the interesting thing. Read, read the Old Testament. He'd been there for years, generations. That was the land that the Lord had promised. When he looked at Abraham and said, go to the land I will show. That's it. That's the promised land. That's the place where he was going to build his holy people. Holy people that was going to give us the lamb who was slain, who that was going to make a way for all of God's children to be reconciled to him. That was the place. It was the plan from minute one. God was leading the Israelites to a place that he had already been, which means they didn't have to achieve anything on their own. None of this had to be achieved in their own strengths. They simply needed to trust and go. And you can read it. I'll write down the verse references for you. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. Genesis chapter 13, verse 15. Genesis 26, verse 3. Genesis 28, 13 through 14. If you read those, you're going to read about different people, different generations. Same exact promise. Inheritance. The word inheritance is indicative of something, and I want you to write it down. And I got it behind me so that you can see it. The word inheritance indicates that God's presence in your life will often manifest as something that comes to you, not something you go looking for. The presence of God in your life, the give me a sign, the direction, you want it? When something finds you that you didn't go looking for, Oftentimes, that is God. Yeah, guys, don't worry about it. Just leave it spilled. We'll mop it later. Don't worry about it. Just, just leave it. Don't worry about it. Get this. Where God, is leaving, where God is leading you, oftentimes, 
It's through an opportunity. It's through a destination. It's through something that you're sitting here going, this was not in the cards. This was not part of my plan. That is when you know. That is when you know. Listen up. Dude, I backtracked that in my life. And I went, I was like, holy cow. There's Anjet. We didn't go looking for North Carolina. It found us both times. We didn't go looking for the SRO job. I spent three years trying to get to North Carolina. I'm a good cop. I could not get hired. Drove me nuts. 2012 to 2015, could not get hired by any agency in North Carolina. Drove me insane. I finally quit. I said, forget this. Then I got approached with a job opportunity. I said, would you like to be an SRO? And I'm like, no, not even a little bit. So I declined it. Then the dude that got it got hurt, tore his ACL. I got, a, I got voluntold. I was not happy about that. And then two years later, when two years later I had somebody approach me and says, hey, you should start a church in another neighborhood locally here in Tucson. I said, no. They kept wouldn't leave me alone, so I finally said yes, sold my house, at least so we thought, and then didn't go through, and we're sitting there with a pizza, an air mattress, and a TV on the wall. Kid, parents were watching the kids because I was not holy at that moment. Couldn't figure out what to do, and got an email notification. You are a 92% match for a job in, some, in you know, Podunk, North Carolina. I didn't go looking for none of it. I didn't apply for Elevation Church. The CP reached out to me and said, when are you going to apply? I'm like, never. <laughs> why? Because if I don't get hired, then I don't know why I'm here. So I'm petrified. So we got to apply. And I applied. I didn't get hired. <laughs> and I was heartbroken. And then all of a sudden, the opportunity that I didn't go looking for came and found me, and I got hired. And I was bougie. It was nice. I was happy in North Carolina. And then all of a sudden, an opportunity I didn't go looking for came and found me. Hey, would you want to come back to Vision Church and Pastor Vision Church? No, I would not. I'll fly out there and say the same thing. I'll tell you the same thing I told you when you called me on the phone. No, not doing it. Let me show you why. You want to fly out here? Sure. He's going to tell you the same answer. No. Then God's out here going, do you trust me? I'm like, no. Nah. Did you go looking for this or did it find you? Dude, everything, everything in my life. I read scripture, everything. Did Abraham go looking for this? No. Did Moses go looking to lead people out of Egypt? No. Dude was tending sheep. What is this strange sight? A bush is not burning up. All of a sudden, pull a brand and you're on holy ground. That means take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. My man runs around barefoot all the time and I give him a hard time about it. Opportunities in your life that show up that are least expected. Read it all throughout Scripture. You will find the same reoccurring pattern. God's presence in your life will often manifest as something you did not go looking for, but rather it finds you. Inheritance. It's not about achieving something. It is about being on the receiving end of things. But what do you do? What do you do when you're working so hard? You're working so hard out here. And you're sacrificing and you're having faith and you're making the cuts and you're doing all the things and you're sweating, but it's good and it's great and it's awesome and we're gritty and we're getting it. And all of a sudden, something shows up on your store doorstep that you didn't go looking for. Something shows up that you did not go looking for and you're like, what do you do with that? Here is an opportunity. What do you think? What do you do when that job promotion shows up that you didn't go looking for? What do you do when that school shows up that you didn't go looking for? What do you do when that investment opportunity shows up that you didn't go looking for? What happens when all of a sudden that math problem that's going to enable you to retire 18 months sooner than you thought shows up? What do you do? What do how do you know? God, how, that's why I went to Dallas. God, I got to know. I got to know. The Bible gives us a litmus test. It's in 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. And here it is, verse 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That's why I went to Dallas. That's why I went to Dallas. I had an opportunity show up on my doorstep that I did not go looking for. About three months ago, 
Three months ago, I told you I'm trying to network with pastors all up and down Silver Bell, and I'm doing that, and we're meeting people. It's, it's taken a few times, but we're getting there. And one of the individuals that, for whatever reason, I've not been able to network with, we, we caught up about three months ago, finally. And uh, I'm like, is this where you're leading us? Because if you don't know what we've been trying to do, you know, we've been trying to tenaciously balance this budget. There was numerous reasons I said no, many of which I will not get into. But I'll tell you, at the beginning of the year, we had a five-five, and we say that right, five-figure deficit that we had to close. And by the grace of God, we did it. Where's Angie? You remember that conversation? Annie was in there too. There was a one time. By this date, we will be balanced. I don't care what it takes. By this date, it will happen. And by God's grace, we're there. Y'all, we're balanced. We are in the black. We have done it. Praise God, we have done the work we have made. Absolutely. We have done it. Took the hits, made the cuts, but we, we are balanced. And that's tough. That's tough. Because on the surface, we're balanced. But if you were here a few weeks ago when I was in Dallas, you got to hear these fine men behind me speak. And uh, they, you guys shared what it took. Uh, wow, it's hard. You guys shared what it took to get there because I sh- shared with you what it took to get there. And this is why I love these four. Because they looked at it. And remember, I made one decision. One, they have to be able to outvote me. They have to be able to, they have, they, I cannot, I cannot be the sole proprietor of this. I cannot be the, the, the guy in charge. Too much weight. It'll crush me. They have to be able to make, we all collectively make decisions. And I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to go after what I believe is God's best. But there are times where I will go after what I believe is God's best. But these four can overrule me. We can vote it. And we argue everything. And these four collectively came together and said, Cole, we can't let you continue to do this. Graham, you said it best. We can't build this church on your back. You can't. That's why I love these guys. They save me from me. Y'all, I ain't tired. I say it. I'm tired. of Just give me a second. I will run into that wall 8,000 times. Because it will eventually go down. It will. Just, I don't, you don't even have to say something. Just, just make me think I heard you say that. Cool, I'll convert it to fuel. I'll run through it. Great. Did they really say that? Maybe, I don't know. But that's what I'm telling myself they said, because now I'm mad. And I can go. And that's a great way to keep you, keep, it's great in football, it's great in the police department, but what do you always tell them? A, death, a, a, a defense mechanism in one season will kill you in the next. Will kill you in the next. And you guys are sitting here going like, you can't do this. You cannot do, we cannot let you keep doing this. I said, I'm not tired of fighting. I'm really not. I'm not tired of fighting at all. I just don't believe we have to anymore. I don't believe that we have to keep fighting. Because of what God brought our way, I told you I've been networking with pastors in the area, and one of the pastors that I reached out to is actually a fairly new pastor in the area. It's Pastor Barry Haggerty. If you guys, anybody live in Continental Ranch, Silver Bell in that area, or go to, go, you guys know where Growlers is at? Right? This is where all the people go like, well, I want to say yes, but if I say yes, then people are going to know some things. So I go to Growlers, okay? So many sermons have been written from Growlers, okay? I'm just letting you know from now. You might go to Native C, C, see me sitting in the bar. I'm not drinking, but I'm writing, okay? All right? Listen, I love it because that's where people are. That's where people are, right? So you know where Growlers is? That's where they started meeting. Barry, Barry Haggerty pastors the King's Church. Um, they're an Assembly of God church, um, really based in, in kind of in, in, the, in the Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines in that area. They got a couple locations stateside. They have like over 1,600 different affiliates, and um, they're here. Started in the neighborhood, started in Conlon Ranch, and it was fun talking because we're doing the same things. We're talking about the same stuff, sharing the gospel. And, you know, this dude had 40 people in his living room on Christmas morning. That's where their church met. And at the end of last year, they, this, they've been looking at these because it's, I can't find anywhere to meet. They've been up and down the Silver Bell Corridor. They feel like this is their spot. I can't find somewhere to meet. And they came across, uh, if you know where Growlers is, the building behind it, it's, um, 
It's owned by Marana Unified School District, but used to be the Marana Health Center, currently occupied by a new church. Most Marana thing I've said all day. <laughs> I, I'm from here, so I can say it. But when they got in there, they were told, they said, hey, you know, just FYI, at some point, the school district is going to start renovating this place. So this is, this is a temporary fix. It's not a permanent solution. Well, when's that going to happen? Oh, don't worry about it. Some, sometime in 2024. Well, that's what Pastor Barry was talking to me about. He basically said, hey, Cole, I'm going to get to the chase. Um, <laughs> the school district told us that we got to be out by November 1st. And I'm like, well, that's a bummer. You know, well, how can I help? How can I help? You know, I said, well, we're not going to leave you high and dry, dude. I mean, that's, that's kind of why we're out here networking is we all have needs. We got to figure out what one another's needs are instead of trying to handle them in our own strengths. We're the body. We are the church. The church is not this building. The church are these people. We are here. How can we help? What do you need? He goes, well, right now we need a place to meet. I'm like, well, well, we meet on Sundays, but we don't meet on Saturdays. You're more than welcome to move in here with us. We can find a way to split the building. We can figure that out, you know. And he goes, actually, here's the problem. We're an assembly of God church, which means that we're mandated to meet Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, Wednesday evenings. So maybe you guys meet on Saturdays. And I'm kind of like, well, maybe we do. And, you know, board, we talked about that. And we, <laughs> that was a fun day in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it. The Lord answered with lightning, man. That was, that was a one time where we stopped. The hair on, the hair on y'all's head stood up. <laughs> I mean, that one lightning strike, boom, and we were like, let's go, in, let's go inside right now. <laughs> that scared us. That, I mean, that, we felt that in our chest. We were like, let's go inside. And, um, and we went back and forth about what the pros, what the cons were and everything, why we should do this, why we shouldn't do this. And uh, I'm sitting here, and I'm going like, what do we do? And so I went back to him and just said, you know, I don't know if this is a huge win for us. And he goes, well, let me, let, me, let me make a counter. I don't know if this is true or not, but, you know, heard through the grapevine, you guys might be struggling to pay for your building. Maybe, maybe we buy it from you. I'm like, I don't know who you, where you got, actually I do, but <laughs> I just said I don't know where you got your information from, but um, that was true about a year ago, but as of now, we were actually balanced and uh, actually been working with Ministry Partners Investment Company, um, actually we got a chance to have lunch or breakfast with them. I mean, they are very much like, keep going. You guys need time. You've done everything that we've asked you to do. We are in your court. We're help. Here we go. Here we go. Bought time. Got time we need. So I'm sitting here going like, we're healthy. We're actually making all the strides that, that we need to make. What do we, what do, we do about this? How do, we, how do we handle this? You know, but even as this guy's talking to me, I'm sitting here going, they have the funding but don't have a facility. We have a facility, but funding is, we're struggling, and there's, there's needs all over the place. They say need. There's need. There's a glaring need. We got needs, but they got needs too. They have a need. And I'm like, what the heck do I do? What in the heck do I do? I don't know what to do. I really, people walk in, how are you doing, Cole? I'm like, great. <laughs> Fine, how are you doing? Let's talk about you. Let's not talk about me because I'm stressed. I'm great, but I don't know what to do. I really, really, really don't know what to do. I'm trying to figure this out. What do you do? Y'all, decision fatigue is a real thing. It is a real thing. I mean, it got to the point, somebody asked me, like, you know, what do you want to go to eat? <laughs> you did. Where do you want to go to eat? And I was like, and I just stared at you. And I mean, I like, I glitched. Like, I glitched. And he's like, let's go get wings. <laughs> let's go get wings. I'm fast. You were fasting at the time. Let's go get wings. You didn't care. And I'm just sitting like, man, where are we going? And that's where I went to. That. I went to God. And I'm, I, I went with those ugly, ugly cry, ugly prayers to God. Where are we going? Where are we going? Lord, speak. And I really felt he said, go to Dallas. I'm like, you go to Dallas. I need an answer in Tucson. I just came back from Dallas like a month and a half ago. I don't need to go back. I'm not going to Dallas. And I would pray. I kid you not, the same thing. Go to Dallas. Go to Dallas. I told Angie about it because my Angie's Ann, she looked up flight. She's like, well, there's like Frontier Flight, $38 to Dallas. I'm like, what? 
seriously? And I'm talking to these guys like, it's your birthday. Like, go to Dallas for your birthday weekend. Go to Dallas, all right? You turn, go. Go to Dallas. We as the board are going to introduce ourselves. Go. Go to Dallas. So I went to Dallas. Fine. Lord, you better speak. To, boy, did he speak. Oh, did he ever speak. Because we, um, we were attending Upper Room Dallas. If you're not familiar with Upper Room, um, it's the, all the, pretty much 90% of the worship that we've been playing comes from that house, Upper Room Dallas. And um, we were sitting there, and one of the elders came to us, and they told us, they said, uh, you know, they were introducing themselves, and they're like, hey, we, we're sorry you know, pastor, it's Mike, Mike, Michael Miller, the, the, the full-time pastor, the regular that's there. said, he's actually not going to be here this weekend, but we have Pastor Joshua David from India. And I'm like, I'm not here to hear from either one of those. I'm here to hear from God, so I really don't care. <laughs> yeah, I don't care if that pole starts preaching to me. I'm here to hear from God. Like, I don't care. Like, she was, like, apologizing. I was like, I don't care who speaks. I need to know what God's going to say. And boy, it, it, and so we're sitting there. We're sitting there, and... Uh, Pastor Joshua David from Upper Room, India, starts preaching a sermon. It was based off of 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. 2 Kings 13, 14. If you're not familiar with this text, you have, you have Elijah, and then got to pass the buck to Elisha. Elisha was suffering from a disease that would eventually kill him. So if you're suffering from the disease that is going to kill you, you have needs in that moment, Right? If you are suffering from something that's going to kill you, you have a need. And more times than not, when you have a need, people should be meeting yours. And the king comes to him, and instead of coming to Elisha, king, oh, I'm sorry, how can we meet your need? He, the king tells Elisha about a need that he has. So messed up. Elisha has needs. And now here's this king saying, I got a need. And it's in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. It says, now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. Joash, king of Israel, went down to see him because he cares about him. No. And wept over him. No, my father, my father, why? Here's why he's crying. The horses and the chariots, translation, the tanks and all the, all the resources. All of it. He's crying about the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. When you are suffering from the disease that is going to kill you, that is not the time for someone to go, hey, can you help me? No. You... You expect help. They're supposed to help you, not the other way around. But what Pastor Joshua David taught, that spoke right to me, right to me. This is what he said. He said, while taking care, this is so, so important. Taking care of yourself might feel right. Taking care of yourself might even be applauded, expected, and encouraged by all the people around you. But he said, when the Lord positions you to meet the need of someone else, in spite of the needs that you may have, you meet those needs. You don't hold. You meet the need knowing, remember, God's been where he's leading you, knowing that God has every intention of meeting yours. That's what he taught. It may feel right to hold on to it, but remember, the kingdom of God is upside down and inside out. The way up is down, the way forwards is backwards. What does that mean? Write this down. When God positions you to meet someone else's need, you do it. I want you to think of a need that God has positioned you to meet in someone else's life. When God positions you to meet the need of someone else, you do it knowing he has a plan to meet yours. Amazing experience, right? I got these two opportunities that showed up on my doorstep that I didn't go looking for. One is, hey, we would, you know, can help with your building, maybe even purchase it from you. I actually have one that's saying, Cole, if you ever need a spot, we got you. That was a year ago. But is this from the Lord? And I go there, I'm like, Lord, speak. I mean, Angie and I looked newly homeless. I mean, we got off the Frontier flight. It was a red eye, so we're tired, right? We didn't even go to the hotel. We just, I mean, jammed our backpack full did you say not entirely homeless? <laughs> I said that's not entirely inactive. <laughs> <laughs> He's not wrong. He's not wrong. It's not entirely inactive. If you don't know, or any other end of that wall, that's where we live. So we're sitting here. 
Dude, that was good. <laughs> but we sit here, back, I mean, backpack, full to the brim. I barely got it zipped. And we walk in, and we just sit there. Prayer room for two hours, then this sermon, and I hear that. And I'm going, man, the Lord spoke, but then he confirmed it. Because two days later, Dallas is huge. Phoenix, you think Phoenix is big? Dallas is a little bigger. It's enormous. And of all the coffee shops, I don't drink coffee. Seriously, I don't. <laughs> we're in a coffee shop that served breakfast. Of all the places in Dallas, we're seated there and two seats over. Who's sitting there? Pastor Joshua David? Are you kidding me? Are you nuts? I'm looking at Ange. I'm like, I think that's him. She goes, oh, it is. What do we do? I'm not going to fanboy. I'm not going to. But he's like looking. He, he's like, he waves at us. And I'm like, this is now. And I share with him. I'm like, you have no idea how impactful this sermon was. You have no clue. No clue. And I share with him a little bit about our situation, what we've done, all the work that we've done. We're poised and we're positioned. But then the Lord brought this need to us. And I don't know what to do. And I really, I, the only reason I'm here is I'm praying to the Lord. I'm praying to the Lord for direction. And here I think through you, he's given it to me. And then he said, he spent the next 20 minutes unpacking in detail, saying, he, I mean, he puts his hand on my shoulders and he says, Lord, the, or he said, son, the Lord has positioned you to meet a need. He's inviting you to do this. Meet the need. No. Know that the Lord has every intention of meeting yours. And then he's pulling my phone, or his phone out. He's like, you get my number. You get this. You talk to me. You let me pastor you. You let me pray for you. You tell me what's going on. And so I reached out to him earlier this week, and I said, I said, Pastor Joshua David, would you mind? I could sit here and try to relay everything that you said, but I can't do it as good as you can. Can you, can you relay to the church what you told me? And within, without, I also learned that they're 12 hours ahead. <laughs> But uh, by the grace of God, he was like, absolutely, absolutely. And I want to share with you guys a little bit about what he shared with me. Pastor Cole, Pastor Angela, and entire Vision Church, I bring greetings to you from Upper Room Church, India. It so happened that last month I was in Upper Room Church where I met your pastors. As we were having a brief discussion, he shared his heart to me and how Lord has been inspiring to your body to invest your building into somebody else's ministry, some other church, so that they can have their problem solved. My friend, I want you to understand something. Every time God inspires you to meet someone else's need, it is guaranteed that God is getting ready to supply your needs my friend, I want you to understand something. In Genesis chapter 8, God established a principle of sowing and reaping. He said, as long as the earth remains, seed and the harvest time, sowing and the harvest reaping will continue to be there. My friend, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that our Lord, whenever He wants to meet your need, he will always bring someone with a need before you. And as you begin to remove your eyes from what you need and focus on supplying someone else's need, you give birth to your own miracle. Think with me about Joseph. Joseph was thrown into prison, falsely accused. He was sold into slavery. He was going through all these difficulties in his life, but rather than focusing on all the wrong that was happening to him and his own personal needs, he began to focus on supplying and meeting other people's need. So in Potiphar's house, he was meeting his need. What happened? God began to take notice of Joseph. When he was thrown falsely accused into, into a prison, we, we see that in the prison, he is not becoming negative about what's happening with him. He is falsely accused and he has a need, but rather focusing on his own need, he started focusing on supplying someone else's need. There were two teammates there who had dream and Joseph discerned their dream and explained them what their dream meant. What do we learn here? We learn that in spite of his own need, he was focused on meeting someone else's need. 
God honored him. One day, Pharaoh had a dream and, and the guy began to remember that there is a man in the prison whom I met and he can interpret dreams for me. And he told king, he, Joseph was brought in the presence of the king. And what do you find? In one night from prison, Joseph became prime minister. My friend, whenever you sow a seed, expect a bonanza harvest. You remember the widow in Sarapath village? She was left with a little bit of oil and a handful of flour. She was minting, you know, sticks so that she can make the last bread for herself and her son. During that time, a prophet shows up and prophet says, first meet my need, feed me first. She obeyed that divine instruction and took that dove, made the first bread and gave it to the prophet. As a result, what do you see? The blessings begin to overflow in her life and God supplied her needs. All throughout the famine, she did not have any lack. The oil never stopped, the flour never finished. It was an overflow, abundant provision of God. My friend, this is exactly what is going to happen with you. A hundredfold blessing is on your way. As you sow your seed by faith in Jesus' name, I promise you as a man of God, a hundredfold blessing in return. Expect that. It's the nature of God. When you sow, God will give you a harvest. People will bring back to your fold, shaking it together, running over, and it will be a great testimony of God's faithfulness. Remember, one of the name of our God is, he is the Lord of harvest. Listen, he is not the Lord of drought. He is, the not Lord, he is not the Lord of lack. He is the Lord of abundance. He is the Lord of harvest. May the Lord of harvest watch over your seed and multiply your seed of righteousness. Honor your steps of faith. And I pray in Jesus' name that you will have a dream building of your own. In Jesus' name, what Jesus said, cast your bread on water and after many days you will find it will be your testimony as you collectively take your steps of faith and obey divine instruction. May God bless you all. We are praying for you. Have a wonderful time together. Celebrate in Jesus. Amen. Hi everybody, I'm Clint Peake, this is my wife Tammy, and we want to welcome Vision Church to Top the Other Place. We prayed for 10 years for you guys to get here, and now it's happening. We cannot wait to share our space with you and see where the Lord is going to take us. It wasn't long after we met Cole and Angela that we just realized that this probably was the answer that we were had been looking for for a decade. We can't wait for you to get here to celebrate and worship with you. Welcome Amen. Church. Yay! You guys have to understand, neither, neither of these things were things I went looking for. The only thing I went looking for was God. God, what are you asking me to do? I'll do anything you ask me to do. I'll sacrifice everything. Oh boy, Angie and I found out just recently how much that, uh, that's going to set us back, realistically. I told you that I was offered X amount of money to pastor this church, but I took half of it. Actually, they told you that. Um, I took half of it. Here's the thing. FHA loans, they work a certain way. They really don't care. All they care about is the numbers that they can put inside of their little calculator, which basically means for the last two years, our family collectively has made $35,000 a year, which means for the next two years, until we can make X amount of we are not eligible to qualify for a home. That's part of the sacrifice. That's what goes with it. I've done everything in my power, and we're here, and the Lord is ready. I'm like, let's go. But then he brings this opportunity that I don't go looking for. I didn't go looking for Barry Haggerty. I just wanted to meet him. I did not go looking for this. And the thing you don't know about Clint and Tammy Peak, guys, I've, known, I've, been, I've been talking to them since January. I just know David, the guy they work with. We worked together in the police department for years. He quit the police department. I was like, why? I wanted to know. He told me about local Miranda, Live the Dream Media. He said, come by for a podcast. That's it. They both sat me down and they said, 
I don't know what it is. I'll never forget, Tammy set me right down in that room, and she, she goes, what's really going on with you? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. She goes, I don't know what it is, but I'm here to help you, whatever it is. Whatever it is. It's like, well, we're trying to figure out how to balance the budget and go forward. I didn't go looking for that. I didn't go looking for either one of them. And I sure didn't go looking to have a convo with Joshua David. I went looking to hear from God, and God went, you're going to hear from me, all right. I didn't go looking for someone from India to go, hey, let me confirm this in your life. But it came and found us. I believe with all my heart because there's an inheritance waiting for us where he's leading us. How about you? I want to be where God's leading. And I believe everything inside of me. Everything inside of me. But there's one thing that they said that was inaccurate that I have to clarify. If you remember last week, the Israelites had to get ready, but they couldn't bring what was there where they were going. They had to leave the mindset. They had to leave the identities. Joshua had to leave it all back there before he crossed. As we have to do the same thing. Because it would be easy to go, okay, Vision Church is just changing locations. No. Guys, we're, we're closing the book on Vision Church. It's been 12 great years, but we're going to close the book on Vision. We're going to cross the Jordan, and we're going to open the doors to something that I'm extremely excited about. We're going to open the doors on House of Worship. House of Worship. The thing to understand and the reason kind of where it came from was this word church has been driving me nuts because it's, it's actually inaccurate. Let's go to church. You can't. You are the church. You are the church. It's actually bad exegesis of Scripture. Let's go to church. It's bad. We are the church. Church isn't somewhere we go. It's people that we are. A house or a gathering place is just the main building in which we worship house of worship makes makes total sense and so what I want you to realize is I told you that they have to be out of there by November 1st they don't have a place to meet we've got one sitting here for us and so I want everybody to say back to me October 22nd October 22nd that's a Sunday say it in unison loud and proud October Some people's children. <laughs> they looked at each other like, not our kid. <laughs> Beginning October 22nd, we are going to be gathering together at Ina and Old Father, 4239 West Ina Road, as House of Worship. House of Worship. It's not a move, it's not a rebrand, it's the end of one thing, the beginning of another. Well, cool, how's it going to be different? I mean, how's, how's it really going to be different? Okay, cool, you can play semantics. How's it going to be different? I'll tell you how. We are no longer going to be, I'll get this, the Bruce Lee quote, the Jordan thing, it's, we've been we're no longer going to be trying a thousand things one time. We're going to do one thing over and over and over again, a thousand times. Because we're going back to the conversation you and I had. We opened the Bible and going, I keep seeing it's the same Thing and we just, we, you know, Lord, I'm sorry for all the things I've made it. It's all about you. It's all about you. I'm going to come back to the heart of worship, house of worship. We're going to make it all about him. Guys, it's not about buildings or places or structure. Y'all, it's about what the Lord is doing in your life. What the Lord is doing in your life, where he's positioned you. Y'all remember gospel nights two weeks ago when we sat down here, we did the plot map and we looked. Y'all, no one lives again, like very few people live around here and work and recreate. I mean, Catalina State Park, Tangerine and Oracle, somebody, I mean, Sunrise and Swan, Valencia and Fort, we're all over the map. And Red Rock. And Red Rock. If we're all over the map, then we have to reverse engineer the flow. It can't be about what happens inside the walls in this location. It has to be what happens where you are. It has to be what happens when you're flying drones all over. 
It has to be, where, be about where you are when you're bull riding. It has to be about where you are when you're at work. It has to be about where you are when you're watching football. It has to be about where you are when you're sitting together with family. It has to be about where you are when you're on vacation. It has to be about where you are when you take your kids to daycare or school or t-ball practice or little league. It has to be about where you are. It can't be about what's going on here. It's got to be about you. What is Jesus doing in your life? Where has he positioned you? And 1,000% of our energy has to be going. If someone's brand new, we can give them the fundamentals. Michael Jordan, all those posterizing dunks, he didn't practice those. He practiced the fundamentals over and over and over again. So when it came time, he could do it without even thinking. Y'all, we got to practice the fundamentals over and over and over again. So when, it's you, when somebody says whatever they say to you, or when that prompt goes, I should pray for them, you're going, I've been doing this my whole life. I've been doing it in groups I meet with. I've been doing it you know, as the church within the church. I've been doing it with them. I've been doing it in controlled settings, and I've been doing it out in the street. I, I'm ready for this. Somebody says, why, are you, why do you follow Jesus with your life? You have it. When someone says, why should I follow Jesus with my life? What's the big deal about Jesus? What separates Jesus from anything? You have it. You don't need me to, to exegete the book of Ecclesiastes to the umph degree. You don't need me to hand you another book prepackaged, same me. It's the freaking Bible, guys. I mean, let's go. We are so versed on so many studies. Guys, I'm just going to give you the inside knowledge I got, okay? It's not a knock. They're good books. I love them. Okay, I'm just the benefit of where I've been. I've been, in, I've been national. I've been there. I've spent on those conversations. They all call each other. Hey, you come to my church. We'll advertise your book. And then two months later, I'll go to your church and we'll advertise yours. And we'll do it. And everyone will buy them. And then you know what? We'll write another one. And everyone will buy it. Not speaking from theory. Speaking from experience. I know. And it's not bad. They're all great books. But it's about the book. It's about the book. And the book, Jesus Christ got into the rhythms. The book says in Acts, where are you at? Acts chapter 19, we were texting about it yesterday. Paul finally figured it out. Instead of having weekend discussions, he had daily discussions, reached the whole province of Asia Minor. The whole thing heard the gospel. It's got to be about you. So what we want you to do is come back here next week at 10 o'clock. Just like with the kids. I'm okay with the kids in here. We'll pick them up. We'll walk them outside. They can color. They can play. Guys, the best thing, the best lesson that your kid can ever get is seeing you worship. One of the best memories that your kids are going to have is that one time where they were quiet and they spoke up and everyone laughed. And, you know, publicly we're like, shh. Internally we're like, that's my kid. That's my kid. Just like his mom, just like his dad. Right? Those are the memories. When the kids scoot the chair across the ground and it sounds like a fart and all the girls look at them. <laughs> Those are the memories. That's what, the kid, that's, that's what our families need. Guys, we don't need people getting up at 6 a.m., spending eight hours here, saying, I'll cover. Where's Tracy Williams? I don't know if she's in here or not. <laughs> Tracy, just receive this for a second because you've been doing this for years and many others have, but... You know how many times when we were Saturday, Sunday, you would drive in on Saturday, you would drive in on Sunday, and there wasn't somebody to watch the kids. And me, people would tell you, go inside, go inside. You need to receive. And you'd be like, yeah, I, I'll do it. I'll, I'll shoulder the weight. And you did it. You did it. And, and you would get a thank you and a nod and a smile, and then we would come in here. And for years, you've done that for years. And then you do it Monday through Friday with kids in Moran Unified School District. They know you as Miss Tracy. You've been doing that for years, years. These kids need to be in here with us because we need you in here with us because there's people at Moran High School that need Jesus. There's people in Moran Unified School District that need Jesus. There's people at SSL, there's people in these elementary schools that need Jesus and God's positioned you with the next generation for nine months. So we need this place so that we don't go to church. We are the church. Monday through Saturday, we are the church. Sunday afternoon, we are the church. Sunday is where we get together and we celebrate what's been going on during the week. We fill up and we go back out. That's what this is about. That's what this is about. That's what you and me were sitting here two and a half years ago going, 
I know we can't keep doing this. Where are we going? And God has brought people along the way to show us this is where we're going. And so come back next week and we're going to unpack this in great depth. What does house of worship, what is house of worship? What is it? What is it not? And then October 22nd, Wade Aaron is going to come here October 14th. If you have not signed up, that is the gift from God that God gave us. We did not go looking for that. He found us. 12-foot cross. And I called him. No. I looked at you with my eyes. We had a convo, and I said, abort. Stop talking. Get your shoes. Let's go. <laughs> Look at me, dude. Understand what I'm looking at you right now. Hear this. And not Brandon. Brandon's like, tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. I don't know what the next lyric of that song is, but tell me more. Tell me more. And I'm like, Brandon, shush. But then Wade said something directly to me that he couldn't have never known. And I was like, holy cow. And I spent the next year, and for the last, since June, this man's been pouring into my life. And I have no doubt. I'm opening the book, and I'm watching what he's doing. I'm going, most accurate representation of scripture I've ever seen in my life. And he's going to be here October 14th for an all-day evangelism workshop, eight, eight, pretty much 9 to 3. Sign up if you haven't. And I'm going to do you one better. He looks at me and he says, hey, being this is y'all's last weekend, I'm willing to preach to kind of send you guys off. And I was like, man, who better? You couldn't have timed that if we tried, dude. I'm like, so Wade's going to preach on Sunday and kind of lead the charge as we go over. We might even carry a cross from where we are to where we're going. If you want to carry a cross with us, we'll do it. We'll do it. It'll be a great It'll be a great idea. So it was a great idea. I'm waiting for her to make eye contact with me if she wants credit for this idea or not. <laughs> she hasn't looked at me yet, so I won't say it. But it was a really great idea. So great of an idea, I said, yeah, we're doing it. And so come back. Find out where the Lord is leading. Guys, this is the time. We're no longer attending church. We are the church. And that's what this is going to be about. And so the breeze on the board is up here. Is We're going to pray. And we're here to pray with you. If you want to come up here, you need prayer for something, we'll be here to pray with you, pray for you. I'll also be here to answer your questions. If you have any questions, we can answer some of them. But come back next Sunday at 10, we'll give you all the information that we know, that we can. Guys, I'm excited because that's where God is. I just want to be where God is. I thought he was going to lead me, but he's leading us there. And if he's leading us there, that means he has a plan. I want to be with him. I can't wait to see what he wants to do, and I know you can't either. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. I thank you for this answer. We didn't go looking for it. It found us. You found us, which means you see us. You see us. Here in this tiny little corner of the world, you see us. You have big plans. Because you've always had big plans from the get-go. And you just said, who's willing? That's what you said in Ezekiel. Who's willing? Who will, who will stand in the gap for me? Lord, there's a room full of people who will stand in the gap for you where you've positioned us because we realize that the church isn't, isn't structures or a room. The church is a, it's a group of people who have given their life to you. Lord, we give you our life. Fill us afresh. Fill us up from, head to our, from our head to our toe. Fill us up with a greater awareness of your presence. As we see where you're leading us, that we walk in boldness and confidence. Just as the Israelites got ready to cross the Jordan, they were mentally prepared to get their feet wet. And the second they stepped in the Jordan, it was, it was just the last of the water went by and they walked across. The only way that that's possible is because you are, you're upstream. You're where you're leading us. We don't go looking for these opportunities. They find us. Lord, we're walking where you're leading because you've been there, which means there's people you want to reach to the places that you've positioned us. And we are going to narrow our focus to deploying the people who gather together, known as the church, equipping them so that they never doubt that if the Holy Spirit prompts them, those around them will hear the gospel and can trust that whether they believe it, whether they mock it, or whether they ask questions about it, that they know, that they know. So Lord, we thank you. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.
Thank you guys so much for a little bit of extra time. You are dismissed. Have a great week.